This is the first time I'm actually telling the whole story, by the way. So inshallah, I'm going to be telling the whole story. But inshallah, you're the first one to hear it, inshallah ta'ala. And the reason why we know he had been tortured, obviously his whole body was bruised. But there was a specific type of torture that was used on Marwan, which was they used a drill and they drilled holes in his back. At first, I thought I was being kidnapped because obviously this is something that happens in Syria. Syria is a war zone. Aid workers have been kidnapped before. They've been held for ransom. Many parties who would like to see the failure of an Islamic project. So what better way to destroy an Islamic project to show that you have an Islamic project and to fool the people or fool a party of the people into believing that you have an Islamic project and really it is a false project. It's just interesting that many of these leaders had origins inside Camp Buka, right? The issues are to do with oppression, indefinite detentions of prisoners, torture, abuse, monopolization. But the reason why I am outing a lot of these people and for three years I've stayed silent, for three years, because some of these guys are aid workers and they're doing good work, I've stayed silent in the hope and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these people would change their ways. But sadly, that hasn't turned out to be the case. But what comes next is even more sinister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to the Muslim Podcaster Show. I'm your host Majid. And today I'm joined by a special guest, all the way from the blessed land of Bilad al-Sham, Northwest Syria, Brother Toki Sharif, also known as Brother Tox. Assalamu alaikum bro and welcome to the show. Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for having me, bro. No, it's pleasure's mine, bro. Pleasure's mine. It's been a while, but uh, I'm, I'm sure we've got loads to catch up on. For those who don't know uh, Brother Tox, I'm thinking it's probably worth, I'll do a quick intro. And subhanAllah, the reality is, is I could easily take up uh, most of this <clears throat> podcast introducing yourself, to be honest with you, but uh, with all the mad stuff that's been happening in your life. But unfortunately, we ain't got time for that. So I'll just uh, give a brief introduction to our listeners about Brother Tox. So Brother Tox is raised in London and uh, from our discussions in the past and from all the other material I've, I've listened to, he's always been very strong-willed, a bit of a rebel. And during Brother Tox's time in university, uh, he started getting closer to the dean, which actually uh, from what I've seen, you say that kind of gave you a sense of purpose. Also, Brother Tox was on the ships which were part of the Freedom Flotilla in 2010. More specifically, the Mavi Marmara, which was raided by the Zionist forces, which led to nine passengers being killed and uh, many, many wounded. In 2012, correct me if I'm uh, wrong here, Brother Tox, you traveled to Syria yeah. uh, to do uh, yeah. aid work. This was obviously at the time when violence had erupted in Syria which actually led to, in 2017, to the UK government revoking uh, your citizenship. So since 2012, Brother Tox has been living in uh, in Syria, doing aid work, martial art, doing some great work there. And loads has cracked off even during the time in Syria. And actually, some of it's very relevant to the topic of today's discussion, inshallah ta'ala. But if you want to know more about uh, Brother Tox, he's active on social media, him and his team. I'll actually add the links in the description, inshallah ta'ala, so you guys can check it out. So, uh, saying that with the talks, I hope that I did justice in uh, a quick uh, minute or two. But how are you doing? You well? Yeah, alhamdulillah, I'm good. Mashallah, you're too kind, bro. Mashallah, that's a very good, detailed, mashallah, uh, uh, intro, Allah Mubarak. I left quite a bit out because, to be honest with you, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know the score. Uh, lots happened in uh, during your time. You know, before we get into today's topic, which is a, a very important topic, a very serious topic, just just thought because most of my podcasts recently, I just can't get away from discussing something related to Gaza. Uh, whether just just get your thoughts on Gaza and the latest news that's been coming out to do with the uh, the ICC supposed warrants. Just your thoughts, really, uh, in a, in a couple of minutes. If you have anything you wanna you wanna I mean, mention about Gaza. I mean, my thoughts are that the situation in, in Gaza is a reflection of the state and the health of the, the Muslim Ummah at large. And uh, all of these things, <clears throat> these token gestures, if we want to call it that, they're important. Uh, 
especially you know in the state of decadence that we are any tiny bit of pressure at any statement as you know uh, cheap and as you know weak or ill will that it might be is at this current moment in time if it can alleviate you know zero zero point one percent uh, of the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Gaza, then, you know, that's a good thing. So all of these things, <clears throat> they're positive in, in that sense. You know, these shows of support, these token gestures, you know, pressure that we hope that eventually will build up and, and result in, in some action. And, and that's the question, right? The question um, or, the, or the crux of the matter is the fact that, unfortunately, there's not enough action being taken by so-called Muslim countries, so-called Muslim leaders, um, and they are sitting by and, and watching while this, you know, genocide takes place. And the reality of, of, of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, is that no secular state, um, none of these so-called Muslim states are going to come to the aid of the Gazan people. And the reason for that is, is because they are happy with the status quo. <clears throat> they are part of it. They are complicit in it. And for them, it's just about themselves. And, and, and many of them, you know, some states are better than others. Maybe they're powerless. Maybe they feel like they're powerless. <clears throat> but the reality is, is that until we have a real Islamic project, we will not see the difference, you know, or people working towards an Islamic project in different places and those projects strengthening, we won't see a change uh, in the Ummah. It's something that every Muslim needs to be actively working towards. And this is something that the Zionists themselves, they believe in. They're working for the establishment of their Zionist state. They're working for the establishment of, of their project, uh, what they have aqidah and, and belief in. So this is this is what we got to understand. No help is coming. It's only us Muslims that if we get our act together, that are going to be helping and and supporting our Muslim brothers and sisters. And Allah knows best. <clears throat> yeah, bro. Jazakallah for that. I totally agree. Um, and uh, I actually watched the podcast you recorded with the Voice of Truth as well. And I think a lot of it was discussed in regards to, you know, solutions and stuff like this. But uh, we won't get into that. So I just want to get initial thoughts on Gaza anyway. So so let's get into the topic. And actually, before that, all the people watching or listening, especially if you're new to the channel, please make sure to subscribe and like the video and share it with your family and friends, inshallah ta'ala. So how did this podcast come about between me and Brother Talk? So I came across a video where you were calling out some individuals. Um, however, the main topic of the video had to do with um, a somewhat brutal crackdown on, of peaceful protesters by the forces of Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which is uh, short for, well, which is, which is hate, also known as HTS. Um, and to be honest with you, to even though being someone who is very active in uh, following the news, is very very active in in knowing what's trying to know what's happening in the Muslim lands. This is not something which I knew about um, when I came across your video. So I did a bit of research, and you know, on the surface of it, you know, it seems that the protesters are demanding the release of detainees and also an end to the group's rule, which is HTS. They they rule that that region, which is uh, not under uh, the Assad regime. So. This is when I reached out to yourself because obviously you're on the ground there. You're going to have more information. Um, and that's why I want to get your take on, on what's happening because if people have been following, you know, since 2012, what's happening in Syria, they may, they may feel like, you know, in the Idlib region, the area where Assad regime is not in control, that things may be rosy because these are the people who fought... Uh, the Assad regime, and you know they have this patch of land, and you know they're obviously not going to do things which resemble the Assad regime, right? Um, and they're going to listen to the 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 wills and the demands of the people on the ground. So first of all, I want to speak speak to you because obviously you're on the ground, you got more 
knowledge on this than most people I know. And also the second one is, um, is I wanted to generate some awareness. Now I, my platform isn't huge. However, if we can generate more awareness on, on what's happening on the ground, especially, like I said, I hadn't come across it uh, until I came across your video. I think it's, it's something which Muslims need to know what's happening on the ground. So, so bro, the first question to yourself, um, Actually, before we get into the details about what's going on in uh, Idlib, it'd be good maybe if you could briefly explain to the listeners, you know, who HTS are uh, for a start. And then maybe we can get into what's happening and, and why it's happening. Okay, so um, <clears throat> it's a... Uh... We started the, the show in a very befitting manner. We were speaking about Gaza and we were speaking about the people that are going to come to the aid of the Muslims in Gaza and, um, you know, the need for an Islamic project. Now, what we have to understand is there are many factors, there's many variables, there's many parties who would like to see the failure of an Islamic project. So what better way to destroy an Islamic project than to masquerade as a charlatan, right? To show that you have an Islamic project and to fool the people or fool a party of the people into believing that you have an Islamic project and really it is a, a paper tiger or a false project aimed at weakening the real Islamic project further. Now that might sound crazy. That might sound really crazy. But we've already seen the rise and the fall of ISIS in Syria. Uh, and we've seen the rise and the fall of that ideology, uh, not just in Syria, but across the world, right? And the Prophet Sallam, he spoke about the Khawarij and their men mentality. He prophesied what their sifat would be, right? So we saw that and we saw how a project like this that was extreme, that was mutashaddid, that had those features eventually would self-implode, would destroy itself, right? And that's what happened in the later times of, of ISIS. They ended up killing many of their own fighters. They were so consumed and so paranoid uh, about the situation that they had uh, created that they started killing a lot of their own fighters and, and, and their own people, right? So now today, it's very important if we're going to understand who HTS is, we need to understand um, <clears throat> we need to understand who their leader is. So the leader of Hayat Harir Sham, HTS, is Abu Muhammad Al-Jawlani. Now Abu, Abu Muhammad Al-Jawlani actually came to Syria from Iraq. So he's originally apparently from a place uh, called Jolan, the Golan Heights, also known as the Golan Heights between Syria and 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 modern day Israel. And the Golan Heights is contested the 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 in the six day war, I think it is the, the Israelis basically took control over that patch of land and they still have bases and stuff there. But it's supposed to be uh, a part of Syria, right? So the name of Muhammad al-Jawlani basically means Abu Muhammad from al-Jawlan. Now, they say that he grew up uh, in Syria, somewhere down the line. Uh, when the Iraq war started, he, he went to Iraq. He fought in Iraq with Abu Musa al-Zarqawi, who was the, the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq and then he was arrested by the Americans and him along with other people like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi were actually prisoners in Camp Buka. Buka, yeah. He was in Buka as well. I didn't know that. Right. He was in Buka for five years. So, I mean, that's an interesting Without me even saying anything, it's just interesting that many of these leaders of who went on to be so-called leaders of terrorist factions 
had origins inside Camp Buka, right? So he was a part of Al Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, his Emir was um, Abu Musa al Zarqawi. Um, and at some points, they say that Abu Bakr al Baghdadi was also his uh, Emir at some point, whether that's true or not. Uh, Allah knows best. But what actually happened, which is factual, is that he was sent from Iraq to Syria in the beginning of the revolution. As the, uh, you can say, the representative of Al-Qaeda in Sham, in Syria. And he started the group Jabhat al-Nusra. Jabhat al-Nusra was the uh, group that was uh, under an affiliate or the uh, under the branch or under the umbrella of AQ Al Qaeda. Anyway, as time went on, you had the inception of ISIS. You had Abu Bakr al Baghdadi, and you had uh, Jabhat al Nusra. Um, they became rival factions. Uh, ISIS, when they rose to this, you know power that they became very powerful taking over a lot of parts of Iraq and Syria um, Jabhat al-Nusra basically nearly was nearly became extinct right um, overnight uh, ISIS fighters were fighting Jabhat al-Nusra fighters Jabhat al-Nusra many of their their fighters defected and joined ISIS um, but somehow despite all of that they managed to survive, and 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 you know, although in a in a weakened position, they managed to to keep their structure right. I, I liken it to like Voldemort in the Harry Potter series. I don't know if you, if you ever read the Harry Potter, strange, right? But on the cusps of death, and then surviving, and then regaining power, um, and this is what happened when ISIS started to weaken and dwindle. Jabhat al-Nusra again began to rise as a, a power in Syria. Um, Jabhat al-Nusra always had more foreigners, being that it was uh, Al-Qaeda backed. Uh, obviously, that's after ISIS. And then the second, you could say the, the rival Islamic group in Syria was a group called Ahrar al-Sham. Ahrar al-Sham was a Syrian-based, you can say more Ikhwan al-Muslimin uh, kind of backed or theologically Ikhwan al-Muslimin. They also had foreigners, but nowhere near uh, that amount as Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, but both of these two projects were kind of vying for the right to be the Islamic project in Syria. Uh, Ahrar al-Sham um, was a group that had a lot of strength. They had large swathes of Syria also. And then in a mysterious attack, till today, nobody knows uh, who was the, the you could say, the, the person who took credit for it or who, you know, exacted that attack. Basically, the top level of their leadership was all taken out in one strike. Now, the interesting thing about this strike was that this strike, they were in a secret meeting underground in a place called Ram Hamdan. You can check this out. And this is quite early on. Okay, I, I can't remember the year off the top of my head, but I'm assuming it's maybe 15, 16, um, 2015, 2016, something like that, maybe earlier. And Abu Abdullah Hamawi, who was the head of that group from Hama. And all of his leaders were killed in a gas attack in a basement in Ram Hamdan. And it wasn't an airstrike. Uh, it's said that someone within their ranks basically poisoned them all. I think it was 24 uh, to 30 members of the leadership all killed in that one attack. And, uh, attack. Until today, nobody knows who killed them. All they know is that it was an inside job, right? So that significantly weakened Ahrar al-Sham. Um, and then after that, um, Jabhat al-Nusra took various forms. 
they broke their beta, famously broke their beta with Al Qaeda, uh, saying that they no longer, um, you know, are a part of Al Qaeda, and then they started to search for legitimacy. Uh, you could say from the West, they had various inceptions after Jabhat al Nusra. There was Jaysh al Fatah, and then from Jaysh al Fatah, it eventually became Hayat Tahrir al Sham. A lot of the leaders of Ahrar al Sham joined Hayat Tahrir al Sham, but of course, you got to understand this is the condensed, far weakened, ideologically weakened version of Ahrar al Sham. Um, and that formed this new group, Hayat Tahrir al Sham. Since it was formed, Hayat Tahrir al Sham has had no victories, no victories against the regime. Obviously, in 2017, when the Russians started to have more of a prominence on the ground, that is a factor. But it goes to show that this group has, in the era of HTS, has no military achievements except for losses. Since they've taken power in Idlib, all that they have done is lost large swathes of territory. Um, so this is the group that is, is Hayat Tahrir al-Sham. They consolidated their power in Idlib by basically fighting all of the other groups, um, whether they were uh, Islamic, whether they were foreign groups, whether they were more, uh, you could say, Free Syrian Army liberal, or I wouldn't say liberal, maybe more uh, groups that were kind of just more That's militia just... and not, not as Islamic, not as religious maybe. And... A lot of them groups came to the north um, and they consolidated their power uh, in Idlib. And, and that's the current status quo at the moment. We have in northern Syria, we have two main areas. We have the countryside of Idlib, uh, Idlib which is controlled by HTS, and we have the countryside of Aleppo, which is controlled by the Free Syrian Army. And now it's a very important uh, thing to understand that the Free Syrian Army, many people ask, what's the Free Syrian Army? And, and the problem is when people will say, are the Free Syrian Army Islamic? Are they not Islamic? What are their goals? Who are they? What is their identity? Now, most people, they would give a very uh, basic answer to this question. And it's important to understand the way that these coalitions are formed. The Free Syrian Army is basically a grouping of lots of different military groups from different areas, right? So most of these Syria, uh, Free Syrian Army groups now, now all come under the banner of Turkish administration. They take their salaries from, from Turkey. And the territories that, that I'm in now, for example, are areas that were freed from either ISIS uh, side by side with the Turkish coalition or uh, freed from the PKK uh, also with the support of the Turks, right? So these areas uh, were liberated and taken in, in, in that manner, okay? So the Free Syrian Army ha actually has many groups that have very, they're a spectrum. So for example, in the areas I'm in now, there's probably about 50 different Free Syrian Army groups. To label them all secular is a vast uh, misrepresentation. Uh, here in the north, you have uh, groups, military groups that are Ash'ari Sufis. So they're Islamic, they're Ash'ari Sufis. They are backed by Sheikh Usama Rifai, who was the uh, the Imam of the Umawi Mosque in Damascus. He currently resides in Turkey. This group is called uh, Jabh Shamir. It's one of the bigger groups on this side. You also have uh, another group called Jaysh al-Islam, which is a Salafi Hanbali group, which is also under the banner of the Free Syrian Army. And they are fierce enemies of HTS. They are fighting over the, you can say the, uh, the baton for who is holding the Salafi Jihad in, in, in Syria. 
Then you have groups like Ahrar al-Sham, they still exist, although in a much weaker form, they are split in two. You have Ahrar Sufan, which is basically HTS now. And then you have Ahrar, uh, you could say Magawir al-Sham. These guys are uh, on this side and they are against HTS. And so, and then you've got a spectrum. You've got some groups which are just complete mercenaries. They are currently sending fighters to Azerbaijan. They've got fighters, Syrian fighters in Libya. They have Syrian fighters now in Niger. They have Syrian fighters in uh, all different conflicts across the world that obviously the Turkish government is, is, is sending them to. So it's a spectrum. It's not to say that, and this is what a lot of fanboys, a lot of people in the UK will say, HTS is the only Islamic project. Everybody else is secular and they want, you know, uh, a, a democratic state. This is the way that the picture is painted. But the reality is, 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 is far different than that. And then in Idlib, you also have many other groups, but they are living in kind of, they're living dormant. So you have many, many groups that are in Idlib, but they're dormant because you could say HTS has defanged them. Right, if that makes sense. So that's a a very simplistic. I've tried my best to give you a simple understanding of, um, you know, uh, the current demographics of Syria. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that. I can go into detail details with a map, um, and explain to you a lot more details. So if you've got any questions, then you can you can jump in. Yeah, yeah. To be honest with you, will talks. That's far more comprehensive than I expected. But okay, so actually, to be honest with you, it paints a good picture uh, in terms of uh, where we are with that. So, you know, in the area that you reside in, right? This is the area yeah. that is under the Free Syrian Army. Yeah, uh, it's under the Free Syrian Army. Again, like I said to you, which is a coalition. The Free Syrian yeah. Army is the umbrella. The umbrella, the that's fine. That I live in is, called, uh, is controlled by a group called Jab Hashamiyah. Jabhat cool. is the Ash'ari Sufi group that I was telling you about. So, um, I so in terms of the area that's under HTS's control. So, in regards to the uh, the protests that we're seeing now, I mean, I saw this one picture where there was this guy holding a banner up, saying uh, like Assad equals Baghdadi equals Al Jolani. The faces are the same. Uh, faces are different, but the crime is one. So. You got people who are quite openly now, um, you know, showing their resentment to this group. But in terms of then uh, the protests, in terms of from what I from what I read, I think the issue started around February, where um, a whether it was Akhrar or Sham, I'm not sure. A a different arrival group's member was uh, kidnapped, and I think he was tortured and he was killed, and I think that led to people wanting some sort of justice and then also loads of other people are being uh, locked up as well um, and even though HTS have on paper they've tried to come out and say well we, we're listening to people's concerns and we're going to try to address these issues it seems like nothing's happened so in terms of the area then because obviously it seems like these, the issue the crackdown the, the, the protests are not happening in the area you reside in so in the area which is under HTS What's happening? So, uh, yeah, like you correctly said, that obviously the, the, the issues are to do with oppression, uh, indefinite detentions of, of, of prisoners, um, torture, abuse, uh, monopolization. Um, a lot of these are the, are the major reasons for the kind of, you know, uprising, you could say, or the, the protests that are taking place in Idlib right now. Now, HTS has had a long history of this. Uh, myself and Brother Bilal Abdul Karim, we've been speaking out against HTS whilst we were in Idlib. Um, since the death of uh, a man called Marwan Umki. Now, Marwan Umki was a guy, I don't know him, he's not my relative, I know nothing about the guy. But what I do know is that his mother came to us. She said to us, look what they did to my son. Um, and she basically sh showed us images of the dead body of her son that had been given back to her. 
Her son was in prison in the central prison in Idlib city, which was under the control of HTS. And basically he had been tortured. And the reason why we know he had been tortured, obviously his whole body was bruised, but there was a specific type of torture that was used on Marwan, which was they used a drill and they drilled holes in his back. So when we saw this incident and we saw what had happened and his mother had come to us, uh, myself uh, and Bilal, we approached HTS. Just, um, just a quick question about the talk. So at this time, you were not living where you are now. You were in living in Idlib. Yes, that's right. I was living in Idlib. Okay. So uh, we approached HTS. HTS didn't have the same, you could say, kind of power that they have today in terms of the dismantling of, you know, the majority of the groups in, in Idlib. So at that time, we went and we 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 sat with HTS. Uh, this is when they were kind of on the beginning of their rise to, to, to consolidating the power that they have today. And we sat with them. We had a lead, we had a we had a meeting actually with some of the foreign leaders in HTS and some of the Syrians. Um, there were certain personalities there uh, in that meeting, English speakers. Um, and we spoke about the killing of uh, Marwan Umki. And one of the people that was there at that time, actually I will mention his name because it's important that these people's names are mentioned now, was Dr. Shadu, a humanitarian doctor. He was a, a good friend of mine. Um, and the meeting actually took place in uh, one of his, you could say, warehouses. We sat with the, the HTS leaders. At that point, the doctor, he had organized it so we could get our view across. And we spoke to his brothers and we said to them, look, this issue that has taken place is completely unacceptable. In Islam, we understand we have capital punishment, but um, this is absolutely disgusting. This is against Islam. How can somebody die in your prison with holes from a drill in his back? And the response at that time from these HTS leaders, one who is an uh, Australian, his name is Abu Mariam Australi, also known as Ibrahim bin Mas'ud. Um, he's one of the higher senior level, uh, you could say, HTS officers as a foreigner. Their response at the time was, oh, you don't know, like, this guy, he was a drug dealer, and, you know, he was the worst criminal, and all of this kind of stuff. And our response to them was that, was he not a Muslim? The blood of a Muslim is sacred. How can this happen? Even if he's the worst person in the world, we don't care. At the end of the day, this is unacceptable. If his punishment, you guys believe that according to Islam, his punishment was the death penalty and there was a proper procedure and that's what you believe, we are willing to accept that. Right? But torturing people Right, and then them dying this way, and there being no pro uh, process is completely reprehensible. And so this was the conversation that we had in 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 it was I can't even remember what year it was, right? But we can probably check it online. And they made all of the excuses under the sun. They said, you know, uh, look, this person you don't know him. He's not even your relative. Why are you asking about him? We're like we didn't come to Syria for our relatives. Do you understand? We came to stop oppression. So this was um, very early. On that we had these conversations. Um, so at, the, at this stage, they, they they were they were decent enough to listen to your you know your your issues, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we we had a we had a decent relationship with some of these brothers at that time, in the sense that we would you know whenever there were issues, we would try and solve them via them. But the more powerful the group was getting, the more it would fall on deaf ears. Mm. Previously. We could go with qualms. We could get people out of prison. We could we could do stuff. The, the more powerful and emboldened, emboldened they became, 
uh, the less our words were having an effect. And that's the reason why the next step happened. Uh, with this specific case, um, we did a piece with Bilal Abdul Karim and, and Marwan's mother publicly. You, you probably find it online somewhere. And she came and she showed the photos and she spoke about what had happened to her son. As soon as we did that, it caused a, uh, you could say a panic. You could say they started to move. Uh, and then they went and visited the mum. Uh, they apparently paid, you know, blood money to the mother, etc., etc. And we were like, when we came to you first, why were you making all of the excuses under the sun? Why didn't you just, you know, admit your fault and, and do what needed to be done, right? And this was the beginning of the creating of a bad feeling because they were like, you embarrassed us. Why did you go public? Mm. Who, are you, who are you to go public? But what it showed to us is that they didn't fear... Uh, the words or protests, these were not things that they feared, but what they feared was media. So what ended up happening was there was other incidents that happened that were similar. Another incident was a, funnily enough, the head of one of our refugee camps was kidnapped by the Amnis. The Amnis are basically the intelligence wing of HTS. Uh, they're always masked. They're called the Jihaz Al-Aman al Am. Al which basically means the security, the general security uh, machine or mechanism for the freed areas, right? Um, and these are the people who unfortunately are very un-Islamic. They are um, the people that have been exacting all of this torture and doing the things that they've been doing. So, yeah, this is basically where the kind Kind of, you could say, where the point of conflict started because we were speaking out against torture. Um, a lot of these brothers, they were saying, look, HTS is the best of the worst. They're Muslims, they're Islamic, making excuses for them. This is a similar thing that we saw uh, in the beginning with ISIS, right? When we started speaking out against ISIS, people were like, what are you doing? They're Muslims, look, they've got an Islamic state, blah, blah, blah. And at that time, it was very dangerous for us. And obviously, in time, we were proven right. People say that, look, Tox and Bilal, whilst they were in Syria, they were speaking out against ISIS, which is ludicrous, right? Alhamdulillah, we did that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we could see that these people were detrimental to the Islamic project and they were oppressing Muslims more than, more, more than they were helping Muslims. So similarly, it's very important that when we see any group that names itself Islamic, that we hold them to account. And sadly, this understanding takes many forms. One of those understandings in the West is Madhaliism, where if the leader does whatever he wants, you, according to their theology, are not allowed to say anything. Hmm. To their theology, they say that the Muslim leader, they use the hadith where it says if the Muslim leader lashes your back, then you obey, right? Now, obviously, our scholars and our ulama, like Sheikh Hassan Diddu, for example, he has a different understanding of this. The Muslim leaders, right? When you have people like Shamsi, for example, in, 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 in the UK, he says his leader is the Tunisian leader, whatever, or the Algerian leader, whatever his name is, right? But it's interesting because what you'll find is that these guys are not really, uh, what's the word, um, solid on their mantra or their belief. What do I mean by that? When it comes to Arab rulers, for example, Saudi Arabia bin Salman, you will hear them say nothing. They will not say nothing. Even if they have open agreements with the Zionists, with Israel, you'll hear them come out and they will say, there's no issue, we can do this. The Prophet ﷺ had... You know, agreements with the with the with the Jews, etc. Et they will come with their evidences, right? But then when it comes to the Palestinian resistance and certain groups in Palestine, because they've seen, and this is Shamsi, he's fallen into this himself. Um, you're not allowed to criticize the Tunisian or Algerian leader, you're not allowed to criticize bin Salman or any of the Arab leaders. 
but you are criticizing the Palestinian resistance because they've been holding pictures of Qasim Soleimani. Now, I agree, Qasim Soleimani is a criminal. Mm. The Iranian regime has been brutal and they've killed many Muslims, Ahl Sunnah, in, in Syria. Nobody knows that better than me. But it's very hypocritical that now you've found a reason because of the Palestinian resistance relationship with Iran, now you're okay to criticize the rulers when you see fit. So there's no consistency in their understanding, right? So similarly, what happens in the Muslim world, it comes from a good place sometimes, but ultimately, I feel that it's very problematic when we go and we cry and we say, look at Guantanamo and look at the West and look at how you know oppressive and, and, and evil they are. But then when it comes to our own leaders, we turn a blind eye. Now, Amr bin Ma'roof, you know, commanding the good, uh, al Munkar, forbidding the evil, is now, for some reason, sidelined. And the problem is, what these people do is, they don't reconcile the, the ayat, the verses and the hadith. They take one hadith in its singularity, in isolation, and they forget everything else. Uh, the Prophet said in the hadith, Ad-Din al-Nasiha. Uh, and you know the, the 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 religion is sincere advice, and the Sahaba said, "Liman ya Rasulullah," they said, "To who ya Rasulullah?" Said, "Illahi wa Rasulihi wa kitabihi wa aimmat al-Muslimin wa aamatiha." Okay, to Allah, His book, etc., etc., and to the leaders of the Muslimin and to the layman. Right. So now they take this to mean that nasiha is only in public. Uh, in private, you're not allowed to publicly account the leader, and then this is where this understanding comes from. We also know that one of the highest forms of jihad is al kalimat al haq did the sultan al jair, that uh, word of truth against the oppressive ruler. So now, is this word of truth only for non-Muslim rulers? Is that what you're saying? So this is where I find that their ideology, their understanding, goes against the the ethos of Islam, which is to bring justice, right? To bring Allah's law, to bring justice to the earth. Now, when you're saying account everybody else, but don't account me or don't account the leaders, I find it very hypocritical and I don't find that from the tradition of Islam. This is the theological uh, discussion, but I feel it's very important in terms of where we want to go as an ummah. This is one place where the West has succeeded the Muslimin. This is why we have dictatorships in all of our lands whilst they have checks and balances, right? They have democracies, which yes, it's built upon kufr, but what they have within that system is they have checks and balances. Trump cannot say and do whatever the hell he wants. He will get impeached. Boris Johnson cannot have a party in 10 Downing Street and breach the COVID regulations. There will be some repercussions, right? So what they have is, there's no impunity, there's checks and balances. This is really important. This is something we in the Muslim world, we really lack this understanding. It's like we have a leader, we have him for life, and that's it. Uh, and this is very, very problematic. What ends up happening, and this is what's happened with HTS, unfortunately, is many of these brothers have basically, it started like this, they're the best of the world worst but eventually what happened is they became complicit in hs's crimes mm. uh, and th and that's kind of where we've reached today unfortunately so in terms of um on the ground then i mean there's also the story that you yourself you uh, i mean i guess your imprisonment was linked to uh you making that video probably with uh uh, the brother uh, Bilal Karim uh, I'm not sure if it was linked to that But uh, when you were imprisoned Because I remember at that time uh, Me and uh, brother JK uh, I think one of your uh, uni friends We recorded a podcast together We, we made a video, free talks At that time because there's a lot of uh, okay. lot, lot, lot of Let's talk guess. for that But um, I guess that that was by HTS guys Wasn't it because uh, th There's yeah, a, one video where you were Pointing out that one guy you were saying look because one of the issues right now isn't just that people are being detained; it's the fact that they've been that they've been tortured. That's right. And that's what happened to you. 
So this is how crazy it is. This is how crazy the story gets, right? So we had years of, you could say, activism and speaking out against HTS and, and arbitrating and, and trying our best to, you know, deal with these people. Uh, all the while maintaining our independence, which other prominent Brits didn't do. Um, they became a part of that group. And one of the things that these uh, brothers did was that when HS came and arrested me, um, they actually ambushed me. This is the first time I'm actually telling the whole story, by the way. So inshallah, I'm going to be telling the whole story. Um, but inshallah, you're the you're the first one to hear it, inshallah ta'ala. Like God. this. So when HTS came and arrested me, they actually ambushed me. I was looking for uh, a house. I was with one of my, uh, my wives. Uh, and we were looking for a house um, to rent. Um, and basically, whilst we were in this area looking for this house, we were actually viewing this house. There was no electricity in the house, so we were using phone lights. They basically came with, you know, uh, tens of masked men. Uh, they attacked my security, uh, disarmed them, and then uh, and then uh, they basically tried to take me. As soon as I walked out of the door, I got hit uh, with the the butt of a gun. I still have a scar here. I don't know if you can see it. You can see it right there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Right at the top, yeah. So that scar, alhamdulillah, it's like my Harry Potter scar. I'll, uh, I'll wear it with honor uh, alongside some of my other scars. Unfortunately, sadly, this was done by Muslims, right? Um, so this uh, injury was inflicted upon me. Um, I fought them by myself for about 10, 15 minutes. They couldn't actually kind of get me down. They were trying to arrest me. Uh, I had my side, side arm. They managed to disarm me. Um, and at first, I thought I was being kidnapped because obviously this is something that happens in Syria. Syria is a war zone. Aid workers have been kidnapped before. They've been held for ransom. Um, so I thought I was being kidnapped, hence the reason why I was fighting off these people. Anyway, eventually, whilst the struggle was going on and I saw, you know, the, the big, like they came with a convoy of uh, vehicles and pickups and machine guns on the back of them it was like they were coming for like the, the the biggest leader in the world i don't even know what what on earth they thought i was right but um they came with force eventually uh because i was losing a lot of blood i said to myself uh, i said look khalas, i give up i let them put the cuffs on me um and then they tried getting me in the car and then for some reason i plucked up some energy i put my foot on the side of the car wouldn't let them get me in the car and then eventually they got me in. It punched me a bit, punched me up a bit, um, and got me in the car. And then uh, they put my t-shirt over my head. I was handcuffed behind, uh, behind my my back. And uh, yeah, basically, uh, got taken to an an underground dungeon. Now, obviously, here there's two stories running parallel, and this is where I'm not sure how to tell you the story here. Because obviously my story continues inside prison and my family and everybody else's story continues outside. And this is where a lot of the foreigners, they were complicit in propping up and, and supporting HTS. What they could have done or what they should have done is they should have stayed silent and not got involved. But the reason why... Um, I am outing a lot of these people and for three years I've stayed silent. For three years, because some of these guys are aid workers and they're doing good work, I've stayed silent in the hope and making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these people would change their ways, right? That they would change their ways, they would change their support for this group, especially after seeing what this group's doing, right? But sadly, that hasn't turned out to be the case. So what ended up happening was Obviously, I'm arrested. I'm injured. Hamda, my wife, she managed to uh, get away. She alerted everybody else, alerted the rest of the family. And at this point, they, you know, said that I'm perfect. First, they denied that they'd actually taken me. Um, hence the reason why the family came out and said, look, he's been kidnapped, etc. Then eventually, when... Uh, they 
came out and said, yes, we do have him in our custody, etc. They said he's per perfectly fine. There's no issues. And obviously my family knew that I was injured because my wife had told them that he's injured because obviously my blood was all over the floor. Um, and so they came out and they said publicly, Tox is fine. There's no issues. We've seen him. The person that said that in actual fact was Dr. Shadul, a humanitarian doctor. He oh. came up publicly and said, he came up publicly and said, Tox is fine and there's no issue. And you know, he's being looked after. It's it's on camera. We have it. We're like they did it, they, they're so stupid. They did a live show and came out and, and said this. Had he seen you? Uh at this point, I'm not sure if he had seen me or not. But what comes next is even more sinister, right? So at this point, I can't re I'm not sure if he'd seen me or not. I don't think he had, but he'd, he he had already taken this, this stance, Allahu Alam. So anyway, my nephew, he went, he took photos of the blood on the floor and he put that out. That look, what are you talking about? He's fine. Look, there's blood all over the place. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, whilst I was in prison, this kind of become my story rather than obviously the, the main story. Um, the first uh, arrest, you can say, um, after, on the third day of my arrest, for some reason, they decided to torture me, which was, and this is where obviously my story came out and I said, well, I, I, I told the event, uh, the events of, of what had happened. So I was putting a tire, a rod put between my arms. I was putting the tire so you can't get out the tire. I was flipped over. And the guy was, uh, you could say, lashing the bottom of my feet, right? So this is called felak, felaka. That's what they call it in, in, in the Arabic language. It's like lashing to the bottom of the feet. Obviously, I'm blindfolded at the same time. So I can't see who's doing it to me. And the, the guy, the torturer, uh, whose video that I've, whose face that I've now released, um, which comes later in the story, um, he basically, um, he basically was asking me, where does Bilal Abdul Karim live? We want his address, and I was like, everybody knows where he lives. He lives in the middle of Atma in this place. Why are you asking me? He was saying, where's your secret? Villa in Darkush. Apparently, Darkush is another city. Apparently, I had some secret villa there that they wanted to know the whereabouts of. This didn't exist, and and I was getting beaten for this. And then the third question was about another personality called Abu Abu Abd Shidda, who was a high up uh, HTS leader who had defected, and he had done a uh, a, a video series with Bilal Abdul Karim or not a video, yeah you could say he 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 done a series with Bilal Abdul Karim speaking about the leaks about HTS and all the the the, the wrongs and but it was called um basically it was called uh, so the ship doesn't sink and so he came out and basically whistleblown on a lot of the things that was going on military failures uh, torture imprisonment there were so many things that he spoke about right saying that look they're losing their way they're not not Islamic no more and that obviously that infuriated uh, the group and obviously because we had links to him because we'd done that interview we'd, we'd, we'd done those things and me and Bilal generally being very close um, I was linked to that I do know this this guy Abul Abdul Shidda I don't deny that um, I know many leaders all throughout Syria um, and I maintain good relationships with everybody that's, that's part of what I do um, I've always been a person that supports resistance against uh, Bashar al-Assad. Mm. I've never been shy about that. I support the resistance in Palestine. I'm not shy about that either. So, um, you know, I famously had the jihad debate on Channel 4 saying, is jihad justified in, in, in Syria? So I'm not shy about those things, right? I don't think as Muslims we should be. Um, so this is kind of where the, the, the story went. Um, it's interesting because I didn't want to tell the story like this but you know what I'm thinking you know maybe if something happens to me at least you and your platform you'll have the story inshallah, inshallah. Uh, you'll, know, you'll know the 
the whole truth. So um, a few days later, uh, I was given a visit. To my surprise, and to the surprise of my, uh, you could say, what do you call it when someone's imprisoning you? You're in, in prisoners. There's a better word for it in English. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My captors. That's the word, Cap right? Captors, yeah, captors. Okay. So the, the guys that were holding me, um, I was notoriously being held in a place called, uh, yes, please. I was famously being held in a place called Ma'mal Ghaz, which basically means the gas factory. It's a secret prison uh, under the ground where HTS tortures people. Uh, it's not their normal prisons, like the one I was telling you about earlier, uh, central prison. These are known prisons. Ma'mal Ghaz uh, and some of the other prisons that they have are, you could say they have notor they're notorious because of their names. But they're, they're Amni prisons. They're secret prisons, right? So I was being held in a, a damp room. Um, mold. Uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, damp. No windows. A camera in the corner is being watched. And I wasn't allowed to have any interaction with any prisoners. Um, this room was actually bigger. This room was actually a cell that was used for normally i think it would be more people in there um but when they put me in there they put me in here by myself uh, and they made it clear that they didn't want me talking or interacting with anyone even speaking through the through through the metal door to any of the other prisoners they they were they didn't want any of that um but anyway a few days later i'm being taken out blindfolded i don't know why i'm going i don't know what's going on and next thing I know, I end up in a location, which was a charity project of a UK charity. I won't mention who they are, but I'm in this project and I've been here before. So the blindfold comes off and I'm in a place, I'm like, oh, I've been here before. I'm like, what the hell's going on? So imagine this meeting happened in the night. And like I said, the captors, the, the prison guards, even they were so shocked that I was getting a visit. They were like, one of them ever said to me, this never happens. Like nobody gets a visit here. How the hell you're getting a visit? This is unbelievable. It's unheard of, right? Obviously, I'm disorientated. I don't know where I am. I don't know what's going on. Um, you know, it was very, you could say daunting. But alhamdulillah, uh, in those moments, um, you know, you 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 become closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It's a it's a very unique, surreal experience. Even when I was tortured, uh, Subhanallah, I was upset, but at the same time I was laughing. I was like, really, you guys are torturing me. I'm the person who's been actively speaking out against your torture, and now you're gonna torture me. Are you guys crazy? Like the first thing I'm gonna do when I go out is I'm gonna speak, right? If I ever get out, obviously at that point I don't know if I'm going out, mm. but it was a sadness inside me as well that look, these are my Muslim brothers. And they're, and they're doing this to me. Um, so there was a lot of different emotions going through my mind at that time. Anyway, I get this visit. And I'm in this charity project. And who do I see? Dr. Shadjul Islam. And this, this uh, part that I'm going to tell you here now. Um, I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this is the truth. And I'm ready. In Islam, we have something called Mubahala. You've heard of Mubahala, right? Where uh, the Prophet Sallam, he, um, and this is in the Quran, where basically you swear by Allah SWT and you swear an oath on your family, on your kin and your children and everything. I am ready to bring my children. I'm ready to bring my next of kin. I'm ready to bring them all and swear by them. And if I'm lying, Allah SWT curse them. Curse them all and curse me, right? That's how... That's how when I'm saying this to you, I'm not saying this to you like with any lightness. I'm saying this to you with complete kind of conviction in my heart. And those people, the people that I'm obviously like the doctor, for example, if I'm lying, then they can come out and do the same. We can do this publicly, right? So anyway, 
in comes, I'm in a room, doctor's in front of me. Um, the Australian brother is there, Abu Mariam Australi. And all bright lights. I'm like, what on earth's going on here? Next thing I know, the doctor says to me, talks, listen, bro. And you got to understand this guy, we were friends, right? Hmm. Not from back in the UK, but in Syria, we'd become friends. I was helping with some of his projects. He was helping with some of mine. And even did I, I did, even though I didn't agree with his political uh, uh, allegiances and his, his uh, you know, kind of uh, approach that he was taking on the ground, he was doing a lot of good work, saving lives, etc. We'd been on front lines. We'd been in frontline hospitals together uh, that were being bombed, namely Khan Shaykhun. We were together there and, and other places. So I don't, I don't uh, deny his courage and I don't think he denies my courage. None of them would, I would never say that they are cowards in the sense of facing the regime and I don't think they would ever say that about me. But where I say they are cowards is in their, um, in their fear of speaking out against HTS um, and the oppress oppression that this group is doing to the Syrian people. So anyway, in comes the doc. He says to me, talks, listen, bro. He says, Abu Hussam, listen, bro. Your wife and your nephew are going to come in. They're waiting outside. I need you to promise me that, what's it called? Because what I basically, as soon as he'd come in, I was like, obviously really happy to see him. So I lifted up my legs. I lifted up my, uh, the, my trouser legs. And I was like, look, doc, bro, I'm getting tortured, man. You need to get the hell, get me the hell out of here, right? So my legs were all kind of bruised up from the from the lashing. Obviously, the guy had been lashing me on the bottom of my feet, but he'd been getting my legs as well. So, like, I'm a dark-skinned guy, right? So for my legs to be purple, you have to understand that, obviously, there must have been some ferocity in those strikes, right? So you can see the the belt marks. What I was, I'm I'm assuming what I was hit with was a a, a belt, a, not a not a a belt that you wear on your trousers, but the the fan belt of a car. Yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what I think that I was being whipped with. That's what I think was something rubber like that, and that was kind of the the size of it. Yeah, of the of the marks. So I said to him, "Listen, bro, look at my legs. They're like I'm getting tortured, bro. You need to get me the hell out of it." So he's like. I promise you, bro, I'm against this. I'm going to do whatever I can to get you out, but I need you to trust me. Your wife and your nephew are coming in in the next room. They're coming in now. There's a lot of fitna going on outside, bro. And I need you to trust me. I need you to let them know you're all right and stuff, but you cannot speak about torture. Don't tell them you've been tortured. Right. So me at that time, I don't have I don't have a reason to believe that, you know, he's going to be lying. You know, he, he visibly looked upset on his face that he'd seen his friend tortured. And I'm getting a visit and I'm in his place. Right. I'm in his place. And I'm getting a visit. And, you know, this is the this is the, the situation I'm thinking, OK, inshallah, there's, 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 there's good in this. So my nephew comes in, uh, you know, uh, my wife comes in, they put all drinks and all this nice stuff there so that, you know, we have a conversation, like they ask me what's going on, but I didn't tell them that I'd been tortured, right? I stuck to the deal, I stuck to my side of the deal. Um, and so we had that visit, they went, I said to them, look, like I tried to give them some, you know, indications that obviously they saw my head, they could see that, look, I've got open wound on my head. Uh, they saw the situation, etc. Now, this is where it gets sinister. They left. I went back to my dungeon. And alhamdulillah, thanks to brothers like yourself, thanks to the people outside, thanks to all the people that have supported me, thanks to the Syrian brothers and sisters, the widows and orphans, wallahi, for me, the biggest honor, the biggest, for me, the single most, you could say, heartwarming moment in prison was when one of the prison guards, he came and he showed me protests going out on outside in Syria. He said, look, he said, the people are protesting for you. He even said to me, bro, I know you're right. He said, I know you're being oppressed. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, all those people came at the first time in the history of the Syrian revolution 
that Syrian people came out for a foreigner. That's never happened before. It's never happened. That, up until that point, that had never happened before. So I was like, I was very humbled by that. That is, you know, from Allah Taala. Obviously, I wasn't aware of everything that was going on outside in terms of what, mashallah, you guys and the people outside were, were, were doing for me in terms of, you know, the things that they were saying. So anyway, alhamdulillah, thanks to the public pressure, thanks to the internal pressure, uh, all of this kind of stuff, I was released. And obviously in those 15 days, I saw many things. I heard torture, I saw torture. There was many things that I saw. Uh, in that respect, I had that one day of torture. Um, and after that, I, they definitely realized they made a mistake and they were very apologetic and they were trying to, you know, um, change their tune. So anyway, after 15 days, I come out. Who am I greeted by? I'm greeted by uh, Muhammad Shakil Shabir, Birmingham aid worker, uh, Sh uh, Dr. Shadjul, um, and some others, right? Ibrahim bin Masood, the Australian. And I remember... I just wanted to go home. And they said, no, 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 we have to take you for a meal. You know, you've got to have a meal. You know, you've got to come. So there's a famous photo outside the prison. Two of the guys in there are actually good, close friends of mine. And then three of them are, you know, unfortunately, these brothers who were doing this propaganda stunt. Obviously, unbeknownst to me, that this is a propaganda stunt to not just the Syrian people, but more so for the Muslims outside. Because I don't know what's going on. I have no idea what's going on. Obviously, they at that point wanted to show that they were the ones who got me out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They wanted to take credit for that, right? Um. So anyway, they took me for this meal, <laughs> and um, there was a speech by one of the HTS sheikhs there. Spoke about how you know we should support the Islamic project, and you know mistakes happen, and all of this kind of stuff. They had a meal laid out. And I'll never forget this. The Australian Ibrahim bin Mas'ud, Abu Maryam of Australia, as he's known, he took me into a room, into his office on the side, and he said, listen, bro, I need to tell you something, bro. Look, a lot of things while you were inside, bro, you know, that happened. Look, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I was against them. I, I, did, I didn't think these things were right. And, you know, like, there was a lot of fitna, bro. And you got to understand that, you know, there was things that happened that, you know, I, got, I, I might upset you. Obviously, I have no idea what's, what it is. I have no idea what he's talking about. But, you know, bro, look, just have sabr and, you know, don't be reactionary and all this kind of stuff. So I'm like, listen, I just want to get the hell out of there. I want to get home, yeah? So anyway, alhamdulillah, from Idlib City, I drive. I'm driven. I'm taken by my friends uh, back to my hometown, which was on the border, a place called Atma. When I arrive, mashallah, there's... Hundreds of people in Mubarak, and you see the. I don't know if you've seen the pictures where I've seen the video. You know, Frank and Fetty. It was a very amazing. To be honest, it was like a dream. Uh, and then you know, I was, I was, I was, I was free. So then, this is where obviously I start to find out, and it starts to unravel, and I actually find out what had happened. These guys had been actively going out of their way to defend HTS and not only defend HTS, let people tell people that I'm guilty. So one of the things that they did, and again, there's evidence for this in, in the UK, is that they went to my family in the UK. They said, look, don't go out in the media. Tox is guilty. Right? They... Uh, went to, um, what's it called? They called up people. Muhammad Shakil Shaq, he called up Umar Isa. This is one of the people that he called. He doesn't know Umar Isa. He doesn't know him. And this is obviously, you can ask Umar Isa about this. Uh, Umar Isa, mashallah, is one of my closest brothers. I love him for the sake of Allah. When I was in prison, he said he's going to stop doing nasheeds. So Shaq calls him and says, listen, Tox is guilty, you need to stop what you're doing, your campaigns, whatever. And he was like, bro, what are you talking about? I don't even know you, bro. Why are you calling me? Right? So this is how actively they went out. And then obviously you saw the live that they did. I don't know if you saw it, but they did a live show with their media channel called Insight Media, where 
Tamad Malik, a Bengali British brother. Um, Dr. Shajil Islam, Mohammed Shakil Shabir, and a Turkish Turkish German media guy called Abdus Samad Dagul. They basically did a whole like one and a half hour show defending HTS and saying how they've got process and how they're the police force and if there was no no real reason then Toxwin and got arrested and how dare you how dare you there's a rant where Dr. Shadow says how dare you people outside you haven't stood a, a day in these people's shoes how dare you insult the Mujahideen and etc etc so um obviously when I came out and saw all this stuff I was like I was shocked I couldn't believe it I was like like my family even when they told me they were like look you're gonna see some stuff you're not gonna like it right so when I saw it I was I was I was, I was like, I was like, it was like the betrayal of all betrayals, right? Like these guys weren't my close, close friends, but I saw them as brothers. Hmm. And for example, me and Shaq, we traveled to Gaza together, right? We had a, a, you could say we weren't the best of friends. We've had our issues over the years, but I've always maintained respect for him. I've never spoke out, out against him publicly like that. The doctor you could say it was probably the closest out of all of them to me. Um, so it was, it was, it was a complete shock. Like, why didn't they just stay quiet? Right. And there was more things that happened. Like uh, Shaq came visited me in prison also further down the line. Um, and he said to me that, look, you're guilty. Just look, they, they're saying the Amnis are saying they've got photos. Just admit it. I'm like, admit what I have. There's no photos. What are you talking about? So what I was being accused of, is doing some kind of coup against HTS. They were saying that I was, they were accusing me of, part, of being part of a group called Fathbatu, which was a lot of Islamic groups uh, that were connected to, uh, some of them connected to Al-Qaeda, some of them other groups. But basically, these were a lot of Islamic groups that were basically in opposition of, of HTS. So they were accusing me of being a part of Fathbatu. So I'm like, bruv, there's no photos, right? If there was photos at that time, I would have capitulated because I would have been like, all right, look, look, let me make a deal sort of thing. So I'm like, bro, there's no photos, bro. What are you talking about? He's like, look, man, there's photos. Just admit it, bro. Look, they've told me they've got photos. I was like, tell them to show you then. Tell them to show you that there's photos, right? So these are the kind of things that happen, right, in these 15 days. So when I've come out, I'm like, wow, look what, what these guys have done. And after the visit, which was, which like, you could say, pissed me off to the max and when people if they ask me they say is it personal I say one firstly it's not personal because all of our speaking out and everything that we said we did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the Syrian people we didn't have to speak we didn't have to say anything we could have been quiet but we did that because we saw zulm but then when I went to prison and I saw it with my own eyes take place it became even more reinforced for me. And even the torture, me getting tortured, I don't care about that. But when some of these brothers, they crossed the line and it became personal and it is personal. And even though it's been personal all this time for three years, I didn't speak, bro. Three years, I didn't speak. I didn't say nothing because I said, you know what? Let these guys, they'll change, inshallah. They're doing good work. We don't want to. We don't want to. I gave, I gave kind of, what's the word? Glimpses. I gave them like, you know, nudges. Come on, man. Don't make me, don't make me, don't make me speak. Don't make me say these things, right? And unfortunately, in all this time, they haven't. So one of the things that they did is after that visit that happened, they went to my wife, Raquel, and they said to her, now you need to publicly come out and do a video saying that Tox is fine and HTS has due process and you've had a visit and all of this kind of stuff. She was like, no. Alhamdulillah, she was strong enough, despite all of their pressure, sending messages on disappearing groups and all of this kind of stuff, pressurizing her and saying, look, HTS is going to make things worse. And you know what? You need to do this. And all of this kind of pressure. She said, no, she said, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do propaganda for you guys. You think I'm going to do propaganda for you guys? You, have, you guys have unjustly arrested my husband. So this is some of the stuff that happened. The second part that people don't know is that obviously they let me out after 15 days because of public pressure. They let me out on 
certain conditions. Seven of those conditions were all linked to media. Do not speak in the media. Mm. So they said to me, they said to me, your case will be dealt with in 15 days. Um, you will not be uh uh, what's it called? You will not be um uh, uh, uh you you're not allowed to do any charity work, you're not allowed to do any media, uh, and in within fifteen days you you will have a case and and your case will be will be will be solved. Bear in mind, up until now, I don't know what I'm being accused of. So while I've been in prison, they'd accused me of everything under the sun. They said you're a spy for Britain, that you are uh you know your your what's it called? You're stealing charity money. They would said what's it called? Um, what else did they say to me? They said, you know what, uh, you've 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 you married thirteen women, you know, you've been doing all sorts of mads. They they accused me of everything under the sun, right? Um, they said you've been sitting with Turkish generals. They said, you know, you've been, you know, they came out with like they were just I, I didn't know what what was going on. They were like this one day it was this, the next day it was this. Every day it was something different. Right? Maybe that's their their kind of uh, what's the word? Uh, like you tactics, know, tactics to confuse you. Yeah, the tactics to confuse you, or the tactics to uh, investigate you, or get information, right? So anyway, that's what happened. I said to them, "Look, no, um, I fine. I'll agree to those conditions, but I, I the one piece of media that I want to do is I want to thank my people." I said, "All these people that stood with me, they have a right. I'm gonna, I'm going to come out and thank them." So they were a bit angry and annoyed, but then they took me back and then they said, okay, we agree. You can do one video thanking the people and, and, and that's it. So I agreed, signed the thing, came out, did the propaganda, had the meal, came out and I was out, right? So anyway, 15 days go by, Eid goes by um, and my case still hasn't been dealt with. So I'm going from HTS office to office. I'm saying, listen, I can't do no aid work. I can't do nothing. I can't speak in the media. Like what the hell's going on? Right. Anyway, they're pushing me from side to side to side to side. Now, this is where it gets interesting. And this is what most people don't know. Right. Is that. I believe and I think I get this from my mom. My mom said to me. My mom always says to me, speak the truth. No matter what. And if Allah is with you, Allah will never forsake you. Right. Uh, and my mum is very opinionated. One of the loudest voices when I was in prison was my mum. They were so angry. They were so angry that my mum was insulting them. My mum was saying this. My mum was speaking. They One of the people that they wanted to gag was my mum. May Allah bless her, right? I mean. So, what's it called? When I came out, I'm going from place to place. They just popping me off. So I found out that these guys are having a, a meeting in one of the border crossings, a place called Babel Hawa border. And a lot of these foreigners are there and a lot of these HTS leaders are there. And basically all of the guys that signed my, what they did is they did it in a way where these foreigners, they signed my release form as kind of guarantors that when the case is going to be dealt with, they're going to, that they will ensure that I will come back for uh, you know, to to it's like kind of like a bail in a sense, right? They were kind of my my guarantors for bail that in the event that you know if if I run away, then they're in trouble basically, right? Which obviously this was all a kind of you know, and this is something that they show. Look, we signed it and we got him out and blah blah blah. So anyway, they were having this meeting in Babel Hawa. I stormed in. Uh, I was uninvited to this meeting, and I basically said to them, "Listen, guys, you lot are taking the mic." You're saying that your group is Islamic, HTS is Islamic. You're saying that, you know, you've got due process. But I'm not seeing any of that. And you lot are taking the mic. So I said, I've got three requests. Take these requests back to your leaders. And come back to me. If you can't give me my requests then take me back to prison. I don't want your guarantees. This is where people say talk to your nuts, right? <laughs> Go to a HTS Al-Qaeda affiliate and tell them this kind of stuff, right? Well, it is what it is, isn't it? We're here to, to speak the truth and justice. So I had a letter from my sheikh 
This is a written letter. It exists today. And save it. It's saved. It's out there. Where I said, I want three things. I have three, three requests. Dr. Shadi was there. Ibrahim bin Masood, Abu Marim Asari was there. Muhammad Shakil Shabir was there. And a whole host of other personalities were there that can witness to what I'm saying. Right? They can witness to what I'm saying. So I gave them, I handed out this letter to each and every single one of them. There's about 20 people in the room at least. And I said to them, these are my three requests. Number one, I have my accusation written in writing. I want to know what I'm being accused or charged for. What is, what, what, what is my charge? Number two, that I want Sheikh Khalid Al-Khatib, my Sheikh, to be my lawyer, to, to represent me. I'm not, you're saying you've got Islamic courts. I'm not a Sheikh. I don't understand the Arabic language to this level of all of these complex terminologies. I want Sheikh Khalid Al-Khatib, and obviously he's a very prominent Sheikh. Um, mashallah, he has a very big kind of following, and he's one of those people who's also not afraid to speak. He's going to be my representative. And I want the date of my trial. If you can't give me these three things, take me back to prison. I don't want your guarantees. Now, they were pissed, to say the least. They were very pissed. This for them was like a... They're the ruling power, right? One of them, Shaq at that time, who's a British aid worker, said, we are the Jama'a. What is this? If you don't like it and all of this kind of stuff. I said, look, I'm, I'm just telling you, you're saying you guys are Islamic group. Here's my requests. They're very simple requests. Like, like it's not an argument. Do you understand? This is what it is. At this point, this is one of the points where they said, look, you weren't tortured. And we have a, at one, on one hand, they were saying you weren't tortured. On the other hand, they were saying we have a fatwa for torture. Because in this meeting, obviously it became very heated. And I said to Dr. Shadu in front of everybody, because he was saying, look, you're being emotional and blah, blah, blah. I said, well, if you were in my position and you'd been tortured, you would be emotional and you're the one who's covered up torture, right? Um, so this is where one of, this is where Ibrahim bin Masood came out and he said, we have a fatwa for torture. So I was like, you have a fatwa for torture of Muslims. This is we'd heard this before as well. Like, it's not the first time I'd heard it. Mm. Every time we'd ask them, again, checks and balances, right? Where's this who which sheikh has signed this fatwa for torture? Mysteriously, it would never appear. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll get it for you, we'll get it for you, we'll get it for you, sort of thing, right? So now you've got to understand these are foreigners, they've got a nice big lush office on the border. They're being given many benefits. They're being given a position of power in Syria and Bilad al-Sham. There's many reasons why I believe that these brothers became conflicted. You know, may Allah forgive them. I mean, right? Um, and so this is what happened. So I've left this meeting. I've continued going from place to place. We're still trying to get our things sorted. I've had no response for them. They're sending us here. They're sending us there. They're sending us everywhere. And I realized that, you know what, this ain't going to end anywhere except that I'm going to get arrested again. Because I'm not going to take this nonsense. Either I'm going to find a solution or I'm going to speak out again. So at this point, nobody outside in the outside world knows that I've been tortured. This is where I filmed my testimony with Bilal Abdul Karim. And I filmed that video with him of what happened to me exactly when I was tortured, how it happened, everything in detail. And basically that was safeguarded with him. Uh, Bilal also spoke to Dr. Hani Sibai and he did a whole thing on torture and how it's haram in Islam and all of this thing. There was a whole interview done with him because he's kind of, you could say, a jihadi scholar in the West. He holds some, some weight in, in, in these regions. So we thought that that would have an impact. So these were some of the things that were prepared. Um, anyway, we end up getting sent to an office called the follow-up office um, for HTS. They told me that I could, my Sheikh, Sheikh Khalid Khatib could be registered. First they said he's not registered with uh, the, the, the conglomerate or the, they say Naqabat al-Muhamini, he's not registered as a lawyer 
So he can't represent you. You need to register him as a lawyer. So we filled out the paperwork. We did that. And then they wanted us to go to this next office. And we were waiting for this chef from HTS that we were supposed to be meeting. And we're waiting for an hour. And again, we've been fobbed off again. Hasn't turned up. So now I said, Sheikh, forget this, man. Let's go. So we're leaving. And as we're leaving, you've got to imagine these are all HTS offices. As we're leaving, we're going down the stairs. I'm literally at the top step. I see a guy coming up the stairs. And subhanAllah, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is just, you know, even till today, you know, it's a, a, a blessing. It's a miracle. You know, I'd seen, observed bits and bobs and different things, you know, hands and bits and bobs that I'd seen in prison, like while they'd been interrogating me and stuff and being moved from place to place. But Allah gave me the firas and the ability to know and acknowledge this guy and know who he was. So as soon as I locked eyes with him and he locked eyes with me, I knew. SubhanAllah. And I said to him, at that point, I knew his name as Abu Khalid. I said to him, Abu Khalid, Zakatni. Abu Khalid, do you remember me? He said, no, I, he said, no, no, I don't know you. And I said to him, don't, don't lie. I said, you know me and I know you. I'm a man and you're a man. Right? And Yawm al Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're going to stand in front of Allah and Allah is going to judge between us and I will take my haq in full. I will take my rights in full. So I said to him to his face. So anyway, he tried to say to me, no, it's not me. And I said to him, I said to him, Ittaqillah. I said, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did he say? He said, how did you know it was me? Hmm. Right? So now he's admitted. He said, how did you know? I said to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it was Allah that let me know who you are. And he was like, look, it wasn't me. Sama wa ta'a, you know, we hear and we obey. And you know, I was just following the orders of the Amir. And look, it's, you know, he, he tried to say this. So at this point, I said to him, listen, your Amir is not going to go in your grave with you. Right? His Amir being obviously Abu Muhammad al-Jawlani. So... <sighs> At this point, when I said that to him, he became in a frenzy, quite angry. And uh, he basically tried to attack me. I had a sidearm. I gave my sidearm to the sheikh and I said, hold it. So they don't say that I'm trying to attack him. Mm. So anyway, he started going crazy. So I'm going to break your head. You're not going to sleep another night, blah, blah, blah. Because obviously this guy's an amni. He's a torturer. You know, he's not used to people speaking to him like this. Um... And then this is where I infamously pulled out my phone. <laughs> See, sometimes us Westerners, we don't know when enough is enough, right? So I pulled out my phone and I filmed that video. So basically in Arabic, I'm saying, this is Abu Khalid. This guy tortured me in prison. He's HTS. And basically when I did that, boom, they all jumped on me. He pulled out his gun. He put his gun to me and whatever. Um, they all kind of jumped on me. They said, delete it now, delete it now, whatever. So I deleted it in front of them and I basically ran downstairs. My wife was downstairs. Um, and I basically gave her my phone and I said, listen, get the hell out of here. Right? They sent, after this happened, I didn't leave. I stayed there. I said, look, he said, stay here. The, 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 the Amnina are coming, etc." There's all HTS people there. I said, look, I ain't got nothing to hide. I ain't done nothing wrong. Anyway, that's when I end up getting arrested the second time. So mm -hmm. they came. My sheikh stood in front. May Allah bless him. He said, no, arrest me, arrest me. What is he getting arrested for? So they arrested me the second time. So now, when they arrested me the second time, this is where Bilal Abdul Karim came out with a video against Dr. Shaju, saying that Dr. Shaju covered up torture. And he was complicit with HTS, etc., etc. 
And this is where a split came in the UK because it's the first time anything public like that happened. I hadn't said anything. The first time it's come out publicly now, whoa, there's a split between these Western brothers, English speaking brothers in Syria. And then this is where now people were like, what should we do? Which side will we take? Those guys, when they had done the live previously, Alhamdulillah, they got a massive backlash. They had got such a backlash that they actually deleted the live. We still have the live. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a breakdown of all the things that they said, right? But we still have the live. Alhamdulillah, this is the thing. When we say things, we're not shy about it. Inshallah, it's there. If we make a mistake, we'll come out and say, you know what? We made a mistake. You know what? We were sorry. But these guys, they're too arrogant. Why were they putting stuff up and then when they were getting a, the wrong react, deleting stuff? Hmm. If you if you stand by what you're saying and you have Iman in what you're saying, why are you taking it down? What If you believe that HTS are this group and they're just and they're doing what they're doing, when you're getting a backlash, why are you taking it down? Right? If Tox is guilty and you're saying Tox, whatever, whatever, he's perfectly fine with all this stuff, why are you taking it down? Because obviously people were rebuttaling them, right? Saying, look, you're saying Tox is fine, but what about all these pictures of blood? You're saying Tox is fine, but now we've come out and seen he's got a scar on his head. What are you talking about? So they were they were getting humiliated and shamed, right? So anyway, end up getting arrested the second time. Bilal does that video. This is the first time it becomes public to everyone now that there's this indifference. And unfortunately, it's sad. Nobody wants, nobody wants disunity between the brothers. Nobody wants this to happen. But this happened at the time of ISIS. Mm. It was you had to take sides, right? I'm publicly known for speaking out against ISIS when ISIS were in Syria because they killed Alan Henning, they killed a non Muslim, a non Muslim that came on a convoy. One of the reasons I believe potentially that I'm maybe stateless is because, yeah, I, I spoke to ISIS, I tried to arbitrate and, 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 and work for the release of Alan Henning. I've been public and vocal about that. And then when they killed Alan Henning, going against the Islamic rulings of 100 Muslims, giving him an, an oath of, you know, safety and security, then I said, these people don't represent Islam. They're just doing whatever the hell they want to do. They don't care about Islam. They don't care about Muslims. They don't care about Muslims get arrested in the UK. They don't care about anything. So that's why we spoke and we had to take a side. And certain people that stood with ISIS, today everybody knows these people who are ISIS, they did A, B, C, D, right? And that is what they lived upon and that's what they died upon. Some of them are still alive, some of them are in prisons, in places, whatever. And that's, it is what it is. There was, we say, Yom al Furqan. It became clear which side are you on. And similarly, this is what's happened with HTS. It's unfortunate. But when we were in prison, eventually, obviously, after Bilal put that video out, straight away, he was arrested as well. Yeah. The story became even bigger. One of the things that we were saying in prison, and we were laughing and smiling. Obviously, we were in solitary, right? But, we found ways to get messages to each other and, you know, other prisoners coming in. And then it was lots of, that's a whole long story in itself. There's many, many, you can say, barakas and blessings of prison. To be honest, I wish I would be, we'd be in a different situation. Jolani's group wouldn't exist and have this power and I'd be telling this story because obviously this stuff is very dangerous to me. I'm still in Syria, right? Even though I'm not in their areas, they've tried to take these areas several times. There's been attempts on my life. Um, but at the end of the day, the story has to be told, you know. And the reason why the story has to be told now is because the blood of Muslims is being spilt right now by these people in Idlib. Does that make sense? So anyway, um, Bilal got arrested. We started telling them, listen, guys, we've filmed videos. We've said that, look, I've filled my testimony that you guys have tortured me, etc. They didn't listen. Anyway, whilst we were in prison, we told everybody outside that if we're not released in a certain time, release the videos. So those videos got released. That made it even bigger story, etc. Um, and yeah, subhanAllah, like kind of condensing the story because I don't want to take up your whole podcast, right? <laughs> um I ended up doing four and a half months in prison. Bilal ended up doing six and we came out after that, after much public pressure, after Martin Smith from PBS coming, having an interview with Joe Lani, that infamous interview with Joe Lani, where he physically asked him, you say that you don't torture people and your human rights record is atrocious, but you've got a British aid worker called Tokir Sharif in your prison right now. And he said that he's been tortured. 
right? So that was very embarrassing for Jordani, especially trying to get, you know, credibility from the West. Um, and then eventually we were released. Um, I stayed in Idlib after that. HTS said to me, listen, all your projects can continue. Do what you're doing. We don't want anything from you, but just don't speak out against us. And this is where I decided at that point that, you know what? I value my freedom of speech, if you want to if you want to say that. But really, it's based upon the Islamic principle of Amr bin Ma'roof wa Nahi al-Munkar. The reason why I came to Syria was to stop oppression. And now if I'm going to be in, in a place where I can't speak out against oppression, then I will leave. Now, many of these guys, one of the things that they're going to say when they probably see this and they say all the time is, OK, you're in the north. There's many military groups there. There's oppression going on over there uh, and there's torture and these things take place here. And I would say, yes, you're right. They say, why aren't you speaking out against these groups? And I say the reason why goes back to the initial thing that I said to you in the beginning. The most dangerous thing, the most dangerous, and I'll repeat again, the most dangerous element or the most dangerous thing to the success of an Islamic project is another Islamic project masquerading as the Islamic project. Do you understand? They're charlatans. They don't have an Islamic project. They don't have an Islamic project. Everybody in Idlib, everybody in Syria knows that. But the fact that they are wearing the cloak of Islam and they're doing this oppression, it's even more dangerous. And that's why they need to be spoken out against. The people, the military groups that are here that are not claiming they're Islamic, they're just your normal Jack Jones, they're your normal Syrians, right? They're doing their things. They're doing it out of ignorance. Some of them doing it out of criminality. Some of them, but they're not saying we are Islamic. Do you understand? Mm. And that's what makes it much more sinister. That's what makes it more dangerous because... What Abu Muhammad al Jawlani and HTS have done, in effect, is they've dismantled all the other Islamic groups in Syria. They've dismantled even most of the strong opposition of Syria. So to whose benefit is that? When you ask them, okay, you guys have built a military force, what victories have you had? Tell me a place that HTS has freed. Since it has been controlling Idlib, all it has done is lost territory. And they don't like that. They don't like when you say that. They say, oh, you're insulting the Mujahideen. And I'm not insulting the Mujahideen. I'm telling you the facts. Either there is land being sold and, and being handed over to the regime, or there's incompetence. Which one is it? If, as you're saying, these are Mujahideen and they're sincere and it's not land being sold, then you're incompetent. Hand it over to someone else that can do the job. Why are you fighting everyone else and still holding power when you're incompetent, right? So these are some of the points. One of the things I'll also say is like, I'm ready to speak live against any of these guys. I don't have an issue. I'll speak publicly about this. Um, one of the things that's coming out soon as well is an Al Jazeera documentary about me. It's called Stateless in Syria. The promo has just been released. They've been filming it for three years. I'm humbled by it. It's cost them over $80,000. They began filming it before my arrest by HTS, it was supposed to be released. And then when I got arrested, one obviously it's ironic that I've been accused of being aligned to a group that is aligned to HTS, which most likely, maybe I'm assuming that it's HTS. So the group that I'm accused of so-called being aligned to are the ones who ended up arresting me and torturing me. So when that happened, Al Jazeera came back to Syria. They filmed with me uh, again in the north. They filmed with my family. The project's taken three years. Um, then COVID happened. There's been many, many delays. But inshallah ta'ala, it's a three-part series. It's going to be released as a three-part series on TV uh, next month. And then it's going to be online as a whole 75-minute documentary. It's controversial. Um, there's some very interesting scenes in there, which I'm going to be talking about in depth. Um, but inshallah, I hope it gives a little bit of an insight. I don't want it to be something that makes people, oh, I've got my tea here and I haven't even drank it, makes people afraid of coming to the land of the Muslimin. One thing that I would say to everybody is this, is that if you want to see change in the Ummah, you have to be willing to sacrifice for it. You have to be willing to give your blood, your sweat and your tears for it. 
This is what the Sahaba did. Um, and this is why we are able to say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah today. And if we think by sitting on our laurels and just making dua alone and just sharing stuff on social media, we are going to relieve the oppression and we're going to see uh, Islam uh, come back to prominence, then we are foolish and we are fooled because that was not the way of the Prophet Muhammad, right? We have to be willing to sacrifice. That's the bottom line, you know? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, speak the truth, whether it's for you or against you, even if it's against your kin. And Allah mentions your mother, your father, your brother, etc. names all the people, right? So us speaking out against our own brothers, it's not something that we enjoy. It's not something that we, you know, this is why I've waited three years. Three years I've never said any of this information has never been revealed, right? Uh, even though, you know, my family has been harmed. People say, oh, it's personal and you're just, no, I know. At the end of the day, we're talking about, I will only come out and speak out against people majority of the time, right? When it's to do with the blood of the Muslims. Even recently when I was speaking, uh, uh, being critical of Muhammad Hijab and the statements that he made about the Palestinian resistance, I'm saying that because it's to do with the blood of the Muslims, right? This was, you know, one of the, the reasons why I did that. Um, so these are important things to 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 just understand. Let me just put a charger in. Uh, if you've got any questions, you can chuck your questions in, man. I know I've just, that's been a, a long monologue, bro. Please forgive me. No, no, not at all, man. No, no not at all. And to be honest with you, I was, I was wondering what's happening because you were starting to break up and stuff. And I thought, you know what, maybe your uh, your internet is running out. But uh, but yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I think the, the, the discussion was to do with HTS. And, and, and I think, um, you know, Alhamdulillah, I got an exclusive out of you in regards to your own trials and tribulations. But to be honest with you, it answers the question. It answers the question of what's happening, uh, you know, on the ground. And, and there's just a couple more things I want to just, quickly ask really obviously Maghrib's kicking in soon here as well so is that linking back to your original point which I think is is very very important is the fact that uh, the Kufar have always had this tactic of you know working getting people to work from within the Muslims because the the, the, the enemies of Islam can say Sharia is bad Khilafah is bad, all these things is bad. This is seventh century. This is not, you know, not in the modern world, right? People ain't gonna listen to them because obviously our books say otherwise and, and they're the enemies of Islam anyway. So when we see the Daesh experience, you know, they were hoping that people are gonna say, Well, if this is Khilafah, then forget about it. But Alhamdulillah, the, the Ummah said, No, no, this isn't Khilafah because Khilafah is this. So it didn't work in that way. So the, the question I have, I think, kind of like my final question to you, uh, it's, it's a combination of, combination of questions, is that... So with uh, the HTS in the lands that it's uh, occup well, occupying or, or uh, ruling, no, shall we say, no, yeah? Not really. Yeah, they're not occupying. We'll say, rule, we'll say ruling, right? Ruling. Um, do they... Are they establishing the Sharia... And if they are, and then you have this type of mafia style behavior where the normal person is thinking, actually, we had one dictator and now we've got a different kind of dictator, then you're not on the ground. The people, are they, are they leaning more towards the deen? Do they want to live according to the Sharia? Do they want Islam? Or are they kind of like, uh, moving away based on the uh, you know behavior of the so-called Islamic uh, mujahideen. So uh, it's a good question. Alhamdulillah, uh, I think that obviously the fitra, you know, the Prophet in the Hadith is a fasada ahl sham fala khaira fikum that if the people of Sham are corrupted and there's no goodness in any of you, speaking about the whole ummah, right? So there's definitely goodness in the people here in Sham. And that's why they are, you know, speaking and, and doing the things that they're doing and these uprisings happening, right? Because they see it for what it is. You do have groups of people that are being pushed away from Islam. They're saying, if this is Islam, we don't want it. But then there's a lot of people that are still 
you know, they still want Islam. The majority of people still want Islam, you know, irrespective of this torture and the things that are happening. The masajid in the north here and in Idlib are more full than they've ever been. This is one thing where, you know, you have to speak with truth and, and justice. HS is not stopping people, it's not preventing people from going to the mosque like Bashar al-Assad did. HS is not preventing people from studying the deen and, and, and learning Quran and doing these things. Right? So in, 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 in that side of things, yes, HGS is uh, allowing people to do to practice their religion, but then so are the Free Syrian Army. There's no restrictions on religion on, on, on either side in that in terms of learning it or you know teaching it, etc. But where the restrictions come, okay, which is ironic because that's what happens in the West, right? Is when it becomes politicized Islam. That's when people have a problem with it. And this is what Jolani HTS has the problem with. If you now want to speak about Islam, you want to speak about Islamic project, you want to speak against us, then they're basically applying the rule of George Bush, which is basically you're either with us or you're against us. And so if you're not with us, even if you're a Muslim, you're a target. And unfortunately, that's the case. Um, one of the things that you do have is you've got a massive split in Syrian society. You've got people in Idlib um, who are oppressed. They're the ones that are uprising. And I've, I haven't done a video. I'm actually going to do it now, inshallah, of what happened on Friday. On Friday, uh, there were like scenes, scenes from Palestine where people were throwing rocks at armored vehicles and you know um you know uh, people getting knocked over by armored cars and and being beaten by sticks and it, it's crazy like it, you wouldn't imagine that that's you know the people that hs is doing that to the protesters that's what bashar done the only thing that was missing was the live fire right and we hope it doesn't come to that where they start using live ammunition on the protesters but the protests are getting bigger right last uh, before that we had HGS coming out and stabbing people in the head and, you know, actually beating up the protesters, right? So, uh, obviously, Friday is coming. There's apparently going to be big protests on Friday. Uh, HGS is trying their best to block all of the routes into the main city of Idlib. Um, this is one of the things that they're doing. Um, and, of course, they want this to stop at, at all costs. Uh, it seems now, though, and this is why I've been publicly vocal about these brothers, is that the, the cloak of fear has been removed. People have had enough. For the last three years, people have been afraid because they've been getting picked up. You say anything, you write a Facebook status, you end up in prison, right? So people that didn't really have a, you know, uh, a following were afraid to do that. If they're seeing people like Tox and Bilal the Kareem, people have followings, and not just us, other people in Syrian society that are getting picked up for speaking, then let alone me, who has like, you know, who doesn't have any social media, doesn't, I, I know only the people, might be, what am I going to say? What's going to happen to me? Mm. And this is sadly what happened to a lot of people. They've been in prison for years on no charges, right? Just because they wrote a status or something like that. When I was in prison, eventually the second time, the whole wing was political prisoners, all people that had spoken out against HTS. Imagine that. All Muslim practicing brothers that had all spoken out against HTS. Crazy. So anyway, um, you know, are they ruling by Sharia? No, they're not ruling by Sharia. It's a, the same question. Is Saudi Arabia ruling by Sharia? No, they're not ruling by Sharia, right? Some people would like you to say, yeah, but you know, women are wearing niqab and people are learning Quran, yeah. But that's not the Islamic project and that's not Sharia, right? If that's what you're happy with, then you, you why didn't you go and, why didn't you foreigners, why didn't you go to Saudi Arabia, right? But we want Islam in its entirety. We want justice. We don't want if you uh, say something or if you're critical of the ruler, you end up in prison getting tortured. We don't want if you speak out against uh, uh, corruption, because there is corruption in Idlib, there's a monopolization. You know, if you want to trade in, in, uh, in, in fuel, if you want to trade in uh, fruits, if you want to trade in anything, basically, HTS is monopolizing all aspects you have to go through them um you know the charity sector right they take they take a percentage from all charities Th again this is when i start speaking about this it's going to be very problematic for certain charities this is, there's a lot of reasons why i haven't spoke but now 
inshallah ta'ala we've decided to take this position because at the end of the day now the people have reached a point where they are rising against this oppression so we have to stand with them we came here for our brothers and sisters right so now when they are going to call for this if we're going to stay silent that would be a betrayal and that's the reason why i got arrested the second time i didn't i didn't do my testimony for myself i did it for the syrian people right because we don't want to see this oppression um and this is what these these brothers unfortunately failed to understand and by doing what they've done they've been complicit in the crimes of hts and they know what's happened to them they know they know what like i'm i'm not going to go far to not to say what hts has done to them all now but they know and it's coming you know when i eventually say what hts has done to them you'll be shocked you'll be like after what hts has done to them now they're still silent it's shocking so uh may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them hidayah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us guide them i mean but at the end of the day at the end of the day if we don't you know uh, i'm going to use a a, a a a saying from a movie um they say that the that the best trick that the, that the devil ever played was convincing the people that he didn't exist mm. right so i'm not saying hts are the sh are shaitan itself or the devil itself but what i'm saying is is when you convince the people or you try to convince these people that you are the islamic project but really you're lying it's very dangerous it's very dangerous and this is something that hts has done even in the uk up until now you still have fanboys up until now you have people still saying people are realizing now obviously um but uh, you know you still have that you've got a guy called Sheikh Abu Mahmoud Palestini he lives in the UK he's like one of HTS's biggest you know supporters publicly he says they're amazing he criticizes the Palestinian resistance he criticizes the Taliban but HTS is you know God's gift to him so yeah yeah this is where we are bro um and it doesn't it, this doesn't bring us any clout this doesn't help me in any way um you know i'm not in a place where hts has fallen and you know i'm going to profit from this there's no benefit in this for me in this dunya you know if anything it only brings more toil and difficulty for 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 me and my family here but at the end of the day inshallah ta'ala we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify intentions and allow it to be for his sake and for the sake of you know islam uh, and this deen and i always say it, bro if we're not willing as muslims if we're not willing to account ourselves if we're not willing to look at our own mistakes if we're not willing to clean up our own ranks by the people within our own ranks at the time of the prophet sallam they had munafiqeen between the ranks right if we're not willing uh, willing to clean up the ranks then we will continue to stay in this disarray we will continue to stay in in, in this situation and allah knows best totally agree bro Totally agree, and um, you know it just seems like the uh, the Islamic project, as you mentioned, um, there's you know no more better time or no needed time than now for this to happen. But I guess we're on a we're on a um, on a journey, and uh, many people who claim to be maybe they had in it, you know uh, intentions with change with power. Who knows, Allah Wallim, but uh, certainly. Well, you like, you, you got to understand, yeah? I'm reading a fantastic book. I advise everybody to read it. The Crusades Through Arab Eyes. Brilliant book. Amin Ma'aluf. Um, you know, there's so many lessons to be learned from it. You know, this is not the first time, you know, Al-Aqsa has been occupied, right? And have we lost Al-Aqsa in its entirety right now? Maybe we haven't. Maybe what, and maybe unfortunately, and people don't like me saying this, maybe what's to come is worse, right? And the reason why I say that is, is because pre-Salah Haddin, right, the 75 years before, the Muslim Ummah was in a certain state, different states, different, you know, militias, different groupings, you know, uh, in Iraq, in, in Anatolia, in Sham, right? The Muslims were in disarray, disunity. The Muslim leaders were... Fasikin, open Fasikin in that they 
He drank alcohol openly. The leader of Aleppo was a leader called Radwan. He drank alcohol openly. He was a womanizer. Um, and what the Crusaders did at that time should have been impossible, historically impossible, with the numbers that they came with and how they came from Europe and they conquered, you know, Muslim states, Muslim territories. They capitulated. They crumbled one after the other after the other. And, you know, other Muslim armies came out. Uh, and stood in the way of other Muslim armies who were going to support the Muslims. And, you know, there was all sorts of fitna and infighting and all of this stuff was going on, right? And, you know, even you had certain Muslim states like this guy, Radwan, okay? He was one of the people who allied with the Crusaders against the Muslims. That's how crazy it is, right? Mm. The Crusaders came to a point where they were now at the the, the countryside, the, the, the outskirts of Aleppo, and they were raiding his territories. And he said to them, look, I'm ready for a peace agreement. Anything you want, I'm ready. They said, we want you to pay us a tribute yearly. So I think it was 20,000 dinars. And he said, no problem. These oppressive rulers, well, they, I'll just raise the taxes on my people, right? So the Crusaders, they were so, at this point, they had become so, you could Bolden. say, complex. Emboldened. emboldened that's the perfect word they'd become so emboldened he said to himself wait a minute this guy just agreed straight away wait a minute that's not enough they said to him we want you to take the cross and put it on the biggest masjid in aleppo and he did it historically he did it and obviously a people a group of people in aleppo they started protesting and they took the, the cross down and they put it on, on, on a church in Aleppo, right? But this shows you the state of the Muslims at that time when Al-Aqsa, when, when, when Beit al-Maqdis fell into the hands of the Crusaders. Similarly, today you see Muslim states doing alliances with the Zionists, Muslim states doing, you know, alliances with all sorts of, you know, people who are open enemies to islam and muslims right and you see this open fisk you see this now you see this uh uh what's it called this vision was it vision 2030 or whatever it is yeah 2030 right and you see muhammad bin salman doing the things that he's doing and swimsuit contests and alcohol coming back and all this stuff right and yet you still have a group of people who say nothing they're not even willing to say wait a minute there's a clear de-Islamatization of Saudi Arabia taking place. They're not even willing to say that. They won't even say that, right? Because of their ideology. You know, one of the reasons why that is, it's because they're comfortable. It's because they're comfortable. They're not willing to sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not willing to sacrifice. They're not willing to, you know, those scholars that have spoken out against Saudi, they're either in prison or they've been exiled mm. or you end up Jamal Khashoggi cut up into little bits, right? So the reality is those people that are brave and sincere, well, where are they? They're in the prisons, right? The rest of these people that are, you could say, kneeling to the Sultan, these people, unfortunately, are the bane of the Ummah. And unfortunately, the Ummah has to go through this process it's very painful to see what's happening in Gaza. It hurts your heart. We will, every single one of us will be accountable. We will, I, 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 I've been saying to people that we will be known in history when this time passes, we will be known as a period of waste men yeah. that saw this genocide take place in front of us and we could not do anything. That's the reality. The reality is, is if that Muslim men of the ummah were doing the obligation we wouldn't be in this decadence people can like it people don't we don't want to like it i will not mince my words for anybody it's as simple as that we've left a, a sacred obligation an important part of the deen and we have a wahan in our hearts a love for the dunya and a hate of death and that's why we're in the position that we are because people are not willing to die for islam simple as that you know the famous words when you know, I think it was Khattab Shishan, he said, 
you know, the Russian said, how can we, the a Russian general said, how can we defeat this army? You know, that, you know, when they look down the barrels of our, our, our guns, you know, we see death and, and they see, they see the Akhra, they see life or those famous words, right? They, they're people that are not afraid of death. This is what the Sahaba were like. They were, they were not afraid of death. They were not afri afraid of dying, peace be Allah, right? They were not afraid for sacrificing every single thing for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And unfortunately, we as a ummah, we, we're not willing to do that. And those people that are, right, you have people who will criticize them. And 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 I feel that's, you know, a disservice. I feel that's problematic. And uh, this is where we are, bro. This is where we are. And unless we go through that process, which is what happened with Sultan Radwan and what came after him, after him came Imad al-Din Zinki, who also was... You know, some people, there are some narrations that say he used to also drink, but what happened? He started to hide it. He didn't want to publicly show that he's doing these things. And then after Imad al Din Zinki came his sons, Nur al Din Zinki, and also who were Muslims who were practicing, they were Multazim. And then after them came who? Salah al Din, who was a leader, but he was an alim. Right? He was someone of serious knowledge. And he had many traits and many reasons why, you know, alhamdulillah, he was able to retake, you know, make Egypt, Masr, Ahl sunnah and it's still Ahl sunnah until today without a drop of bloodshed. And also to, you know, retake Bayt al-Maqdis, you know, Jerusalem and, and bring it back into the hands of, of the Muslim. And it's not until we go through that process and that hunger and that desire builds in the hearts of a group of Muslims, maybe the next generation or the generation after that, you know, we hope Allah SWT to, we hope and pray to Allah SWT that it comes quick, Amen. That, that things will change. But if we stay as this generation who love the dunya, that, you know, you know, we'll, we'll talk about Gaza on one hand and the next minute on social media, we'll be having this lavish meal. That is not the ummah that's going to liberate Al-Aqsa. If we are this Ummah of men on social media that are putting on their wife's makeup on all over social media and dressing up as women, those men are not the men that are going to liberate Al Aqsa, right? The men of the Ummah that are going to liberate Al Aqsa are not the ones who are just talking, they're the one of, ones of action, right? They're the ones who are willing to sacrifice. And it, this is a final note for anyone else that's watching. You might say, What is it that I can do? What is my role? Every single person, every Muslim has to have either have a project for the Ummah or be a part of a project for the Ummah. It's very, very important. If we're just going to be the, you know, Muslim that does his rituals and, you know, praises Salah and, and does his rituals and not care about the affairs of the Ummah and, you know, they're getting killed over there. It doesn't affect me then we are not holding, you know, uh, true to the tradition. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said, none of you truly believes until he wishes for his brother what he wishes for himself. So that's a strong statement. You don't truly believe until you wish for your brother what you wish for yourself. So now, when you see what's happening in Gaza, if it doesn't change your life, then there's something missing. If it doesn't change your heart, then there's something missing. And ultimately, if it doesn't change your actions, you don't become a different person, then unfortunately, we're the ones who are at loss. And Allah knows best, bro. Subhanallah, bro. Subhanallah. Really, uh, I think uh, that piece of advice is something which is really important for, you know, first and foremost, for myself, for the listeners. And, and you know, I think it's uh, an excellent place to uh, to bring the uh, bring the podcast to a close. Um, I think Alhamdulillah, we you know we are we achieved. I achieved more than I had bargained for because we discussed what's happening with HDS and and Idlib, and we also got a world exclusive about uh, Brother Tox's experience. Uh, but bro, listen, Jazakallah here for uh, taking time out. Um, you know you're very very busy there, and things are not easy. You know I was uh, also thinking earlier as well. You know, in my line of questioning to make sure. I don't ask anything which kind of can put you in the uh, the line of fire, but you didn't need me to ask any questions you got in there yourself. 
<laughs> so so uh, um, may Allah preserve you man and, and your family and keep you safe and um, uh, you know inshallah you know may Allah guide the Muslims certainly in the blessed land of Al Sham and and hopefully the truth will uh, will always prevail over the falsehood and, uh, and people will, will see it will always, always come out bro. the truth will always come out and you know life and death is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so no matter if any of these people want to harm me, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want me to come to harm, then I will not be harmed. And me being coward or my cowardice is not going to, you know, uh, you know, extend my lifespan and my bravery is not going to shorten my lifespan. So if I have yaqeen in this, then alhamdulillah, it is what it is, bro. You know what I mean? Alhamdulillah, bro. Alhamdulillah, bro. Alhamdulillah, bro. Alhamdulillah, bro. to you. Uh, and uh, I'm so, I, I'm sure uh, everyone listening or watching uh, benefited from this episode. Please share it with the family and friends. And um, and yeah, bro. Inshallah, stay in touch. I'm not on as uh, a regular on Instagram anymore as I used to be. So I've not really sent any messages out to you when you're doing your lives and stuff. But keep up the great work, man. And I look forward to this uh, uh, Al Jazeera program. I'm sure that's going to be some you know explosive. Uh, and uh, and yeah, take care, inshallah, man. And to everyone else, until the next one, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.